All right, I'm going to go live. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Oh, fuck. An error has occurred? It's fine. It's really so it's free now. Alright, it is streaming. Oh wait, that's on. Cool. Yep, there I am chewing. <laughs> right, live chat. Me, myself, can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Mm. When was the last class? Did you have it on Friday, Jill? No, it was Thursday. No, no, Mr. Metric, where it's always Thursday. Thursday, this time, 6, 5 p.m. Pacific, always. Yay. Hello. We're going to not get started right now. Good evening, Dixon, Kerry, and C. How are you doing today? Hi, Victoria. Hey. Hey. <laughs> what y'all doing? Chilling. <sighs> it's okay, Mr. Metric. I know you're taking like a million classes probably. But uh, this is the only important class that we have. What's up, Apple Brain? One, 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 one. Nice to have you on. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to slowly start introducing myself. I know um, many of you have never, ever seen me or know who I am. So I just wanted to say hello. Uh, my name is Esther Kim. I work here at the Odin. At the Odin as you can see. Um, I will be your instructor today. Uh, Josiah is out on a business trip. Uh, hey, Nidarian. What's up? Um, yeah, so Josiah is out on a business trip, and uh, I'm filling in right now um, for this class, um, talking to you about protein today. Protein. Um, but let me introduce like what I do, what my background is, um, how you can reach me and, um, things like that. So yeah, we, I am a genetic engineer. I am a biohacker. I studied genetic or I studied cell molecular biology in university. And, um, I have worked in the industry for a couple of years prior to coming to the Odin. Um, and I've done in the past, uh, genetic, like yeast engineering. So I was making novel, uh, organic compounds, um, through yeast. So I have these tiny little organisms that made a single chemical and I was really good at it. Um, yeah. And so I really enjoyed my time doing yeast work. Uh, I would say I'm a yeast expert genetic engineer. Um, so if you have any questions about yeast or modifying metabolism of things like bacteria or yeast, contact me. 
And you can reach me on any socials. I'm going to plug myself real quick. You can reach me on Facebook, re readily available through that. I have an Instagram called at Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R, the biohacker, Esther, the biohacker on Instagram. And you can reach me um, on email at Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R, at the-odin.com. So if you have any questions about anything regarding any of the material that we go over or the class, just email me. I'd be happy to help out and chat with you. Um, even if it's like, hey, like I've been thinking about this cool project, uh, just email me. Be happy to help out. Yeah. Um, all right. Hello, Pinkas loves Barlos. Hello. All right, well, let's get started. So today's class, we're all going, yeah, I know. Sorry, Dixon, Carrie, and NC. Well, actually, I do have a Twitter. I'm just not really like active on it. And when I do post about it, they're like usually like shower thoughts or like me fangirling over a DJ because I'm super into that. Um, so like, I don't know, not very informative on Twitter, barely use it. Um, I'm more a visual person, so. Yeah. Hey, baby mechanical, what's up? All right, so today we are going to go over proteins. Proteins are super important. As you know, if you've read ahead in some of the documents in the, in the Google Classroom. Um, so proteins, why is it important? Why should we learn about this? I'm here for the DNA and genetically modifying DNA. Well, we cannot modify things if we cannot modify the proteins as well. So today we're going to talk about the central dogma of biology. It's a very fancy terminology, but uh, we have to learn it in school. Actually, when I was in an interview once, they asked me in a pop quiz, like, so what is the central dogma of biology? And I'm just like, I learned that in high school. How how the hell am I supposed to remember that? Like, I, and then I made it up and I got it correct. But that's that's just me. So I'm here to talk to you about the central dogma of biology. So let's see. Everything is made of chnops: carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So remember chnops. Chnops encompasses everything. When people are like, what is everything made of? Chinops. So let's start there. All right. So what is the central dogma of biology? Central dogma of biology is by definition, um, the trans or the making from DNA to RNA to protein. And the way that that's done is the DNA exists, um, in all living cells. And then it is uh, transcribed. So it's actually replicated first. It's replicated. DNA replicates. And then it translates to RNA. And then RNA translate or RNA is translated to protein. That is the central dogma of biology. Literally taking from DNA all the way to protein. Now people are asking me like, why, why do we have to learn about proteins? Why, why? Everything that makes up a human body, makes up any living organism, is based on the function of proteins. Without proteins, we'll not be able to function. Um, so proteins are very important. Uh, let's say, for example, um, you know, like proteins in your hair, proteins in your muscles, proteins in... Um, you're like toenails, proteins in your heart, proteins, just proteins exist everywhere in a living cell. So with that said, I'm going to kind of briefly go over, um, you know, like RNA. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I'm here to help. I'm here to just talk about proteins and shit. Okay, so RNA versus DNA. Which one's more stable? 
this is a great question to ask because DNA versus RNA. So question, what's the difference between DNA and RNA? One is much more stable and one is less stable. And could you kind of guess which one is the less stable one or the more stable one? Mr. Metric asks, what about the stuff that's sold in protein as a supplement or protein in nutritional info? That's protein. Everything makes protein and we consume protein. We make protein, we consume protein, we make more protein and we function as a protein mass. So to answer my question, it is um, DNA is much more stable than RNA. No, I mean myself, sorry. <laughs> I, I beat you to the punch. Um, DNA is a long-term storage, so it must be more stable. Yes, that is correct. Because um, RNA is very transient. We want to uh, immediately use up the RNA into protein. And then that, once protein is made, then that signals back to the DNA to like stop making it. It's kind of like a fail-safe. For example, if you just keep generating protein, you'll just become like super buff and, you know, you can't be able to function. So the pro after the protein is made, it retroactively shuts down the production of protein um, to the DNA. And so that is a separate thing that we're talking about. But anyway, so the DNA is actually very, very stable comparatively to RNA because the RNA, it has a... Um, additional OH on um, the five prime end versus the three prime end on the five prime end, which makes it more just like stable in general. And it's a little, it's a lot less reactive. Yeah. Let's see. So let's, let's briefly talk about viruses. So viruses are interesting because they can come in forms of DNA or RNA. Um, it's a really like novel concept to think about viruses. I'm not a virologist. Um, I can't really tell you too much about viruses, um, but I do know about the rabies virus. Um, and the rabies virus is actually completely complete RNA. Um, so what happens is uh, the capsid of the virus has RNA in it. And what the goal of the virus is, is to infect a host replicate the DNA or RNA um, inside of a different living host and then be able to spread that virus. That's essentially the only um, the only like mechanism that a virus is. And it's interesting when it inserts an RNA, it completely goes into, for example, if I were bitten by a dog and the rabies virus, I contracted it somehow. And then um, the RNA starts infecting, starts kind of commandeering uh, my DNA and trying to uh, modify it in that way. And so then I get really sick, obviously, and I have to go to the doctors and get a shot. So what my body is trying to do is uh, there's something called RNases, which combat, uh, well, which helps RNA translate into protein, but also combats foreign RNA. So um, once the once the RNA from the virus gets infected with or inside of me, then the RNAs can come up and either chop it up or accept the RNA and then translate it directly into protein. And then by that time, my whole immune system is compromised and I am foaming at the mouth. So that's actually what happens in the rabies virus. Yeah. Apple Brain asks, Apple, Apple Brain 111 asks, what's a prime end? So DNA and RNA, um, they have a direction. So when uh, DNA and RNA um, are, well, DNA is a helix and it splits up. And so there is a five prime end and a three prime end. And the five prime end indicates, um, uh, I think it's like a demethylation of one end. But anyways, it's like an orientation of where replication is started. So replication of DNA always goes from five prime end to a three prime end. And when I briefly mentioned it in RNA, um, it's because the five prime end has an additional 
um, hydroxylase, which indicates that is the front of the RNA where translation, transcription translation begins at that end. Yeah. All right. So let's talk more about um, <laughs> ah, let's talk about the amino acids. So in DNA, we have the very simple letters of A, C, T, and G. Now when it gets um, transcribed into RNA, it actually changes a little. It becomes A, C, U, G. So the T turns into a U. And that is the letter, or that's the alphabet for um, DNA versus RNA. So then once RNA has A, the A, C, G, and U, then it translates into amino acids. And amino acids make up everything in your body. Amino acids are, and with the succession of amino acids, it makes protein. So there are a complete number of 20 amino acids. And let me kind of show you uh, the amino acid chart. Let's see if I can nail this. Oh, it's so tiny. No, no. What the heck? Do it. So tiny. Hmm. I don't know if I could change this anymore. Anyways, there it is. Oh my god, I don't even know what orientation it is. That way. Yeah. So it's a it's a guide to 20 common amino acids. I, I don't I'm sorry if you can't see it here. I kind of uh, messed up in the window capture uh, feature, but I can you can totally visualize like what they are, um, like how many there are. You can do a simple Google search and you know Google like 20 20 basic amino acids. But the amino acids consist of alanine, glycine, isoleucine, leucine, proline, valine phenylalanine, tryptophan, which you guys all know from Turkey, uh, tyrosine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, arginine, histidine, lysine, serine, theranine, cysteine, methionine, arginine, ar ar spar aspargine, blah, blah, and glutamine. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of cool. You can, um, here, let me show you, share with you the link. Yeah, you can totally memorize these. Um, all in biochemistry, I remember memorizing these and completely forgetting them. But as a cool bar trick, I have kept a few of these amino acids in my pocket just in case I have to pull it out for trivia. <laughs> but um, it's great to understand the structure of these amin common amino acids. Um, you can see like they have various different uh, groups on them, which differentiate them from other groups, um, which is very, very important when you're talking about uh, protein chemistry. So if you remember, like all, memorize all 20 of the amino acids, good for you. That's a big bonus in my book. So you can see that they all have different groups and they all react very differently. So what am I talking about when I say when they react differently? So when um, the DNA translates to RNA and then it translates into protein, um, the protein is a big bulbous mass of just um, 
DNA translation. And uh, in the proteins, there are these uh, different amino acids um, associated with the protein. And so a big protein blob can look like um, an alanine attached to like an isoleucine or like a tyrosine. Um, and they just kind of like create these massive structures and they interact with each other. Um, yeah, so let me get rid of this real quickly. All right. And so what am I, what am I talking about? Like interacting, interacting, uh, proteins. Um, so all of these different amino acids interact with each other in a way of hydrophobic or hydrophilic or van der Waals, um, interactions or even, uh, polar, nonpolar or neutral, uh, charge. So charges and hydrophobicity is a big factor to protein folding. I'm not a big protein expert. Um, I think it's a really large, like physical chemical field that I'm not really into. Um, but it's certainly important for uh, genetic engineering because you have to understand what you're ultimately making in the proteins um, and then being able to relate it back to DNA. So a great way to figure out a protein function is going through ncbi.com. And um, I think you can do like a protein blast and figure out uh, different novel proteins that exist in all living cells, um, which is a great tool to figure out like, if I wanna make this more of this protein, I can go back and uh, edit it on a genetic level. So that's important to all of us. Okay, so how about I show you a protein? Yeah, going back to the protein. All right, again, sorry, it's tiny, but we'll have to deal with it. So um, I'm gonna share with you a link, another link. Oops, no, that's not the link, my bad. Go ahead and access that link for you just following along on the video. It's www.rcsb.org slash 3D hyphen V-I-E-W view slash 3BBX slash 1. So this is a good representation of a protein. And we are looking at the HSP15 protein. Um, unsure of what that is. But as you can see here, it's a 3D model of a really massive protein. It looks like spaghetti <laughs> because the mo there are things called motifs in uh, proteins in protein folding. So every one of these is like a, oh my God, can I zoom in? Yeah, every one of these ribbons is a single protein and they're made up with um, different amino acids and different colors indicate that there are different proteins. So you can see kind of like all these like squiggles um, and you can change the view. So right now I'm actually in cartoon view. Um, yeah. And it has all this like space. Now you can change it on the side on style. You can change it to space fill. If you change it to space fill, you're going to see hopefully hello ah you're going to see the actual like atoms um, surrounding the protein which is realistically what proteins are viewed as they're not just like squiggles and lines and stuff like that so this you're looking at an actual protein you have to understand that these are made with like millions of amino acids and just to make this one protein globular big thing. 
So the problem is with modeling proteins is it's not 100% accurate because it looks like here uh, the proteins are very stagnant. It's like completely like standstill. This is just one snapshot instance of the protein. The protein is always moving. It's always changing in conformation. It's always just like going like this and changing um, because like I said, of all of those uh, interactions that are happening. So like, you know, an oxygen or a methyl, methy, methylene would might like interact with each other and it might bend um, the conformation back and forth and back and forth just all the time, just shaking. So um, I believe there's like a video game back in the day where you can like, like have a protein conformation change. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool uh, video game that people used to play. Um, but yeah, it, you know, the confirmation changes all the time. So it's hard to model like a protein, um, and to be accurate about it. And it's hard to, um, give a function to like novel proteins that we've never seen before, even though they're made up of the 20 amino acids and, you know, the motifs are very, very like predictable in that way. But if you probably do some like artificial like AI intelligence um, and then like figure out uh, how like a protein um, conforms and, and changes over time would be like a cool project but um, I'm not really 100% sure the accuracy of modeling a protein is not super great right now uh, protein chemists still have a trouble like a troubling time with this so it's not it's um it exists uh, there is no solution to accurate protein modeling, but uh, I hope in the future we can change that. AppleBrain111, confirmation relates to function? Yes. So it can act like the protein can activate or deactivate, which is the crazy thing. Um, and also there are within the protein, um, or actually within the RNA prior to protein, there's something called exons and introns, and exons are the ones that actually translate into protein, um, and the exons um, are what get X'd out of the RNA complex. And so when uh, the translation is happening, then um, you see all these um, introns get translated, but we don't really know the function of these exons. We thought they were like junk. Um, and then I think a few years ago they published a paper that said that exons are actually very important to the production of uh, proteins. So um, yeah, we thought something was complete junk and gobbledygook and then look what happened. It's kind of crazy. Um, Dixon's carry NC. Modeling proteins is more probabilistic than deterministic, I would assume. I would say that, yeah. Um, again, it's hard to determine the function based on just the 3D confirmation alone um, because there's so many things interacting with each other. It's just not one like swivel. It's like everything is conforming um, and changing all the time over time. So it's, yeah, it's hard to determine the function of the protein unless you're doing um, like further analyses of protein. So looking at a 3D model, you couldn't determine the function of it. Okay, so I showed you that. Um, let's see, any questions, comments, concerns about proteins? Proteins are pretty cool. All right. Well, um, yeah, we're going to go over proteins uh, next week, um, which is going to be very exciting. Um, there is a paper on the central dogma of biology and um, genetical, genetic implications of the structure of the dia uh, DNA. And the last paper of next week would be, what does it mean to be 75% pumpkin? Um, I know that these uh, papers are optional, but I highly encourage you to read them. Even though there might be a little bit difficult to understand, um, science is difficult to understand. 
And that's why you're in this class to learn piece by piece on how to tackle uh, scientific papers because they're also important. Um, Mr. Metrics says, do you have a favorite protein? Not really. I don't know. I haven't really done too much like protein inter like interaction with proteins. The kind you eat. <laughs> Apple Brain asks, introns and extrons features of proteins or DNA? Neither. It's RNA. So when so what happens in DNA is um, the ACE, C's, T's, G's all uh, replicate right into more ACE, T's, C's, and G's in the helix. And then when it gets um, uh, transcribed into RNA, it creates these. Um, it creates like a like a three nomenclature um, little unit that compromises of A's, G's, C's, and U's. And so um, there are things called stop. There's things called start and stop codons, um, which means that. Once you, once you keep producing RNA, there is a stop. So it, I think it's like UGA or UGA or UAA or UAC, which uh, signifies the DNA and the mechanism to completely stop. And so it curtails this really long strand of um, RNA. And then once the RNA uh, gets out of the cell, exported out of the cell, then it translates into protein. And so the proteins, the translation that happens between those UAs, like Cs and Gs, are, um, are amino acids. So every, every like little DNA um, that's completely upstream translates into this type of unit of uh, DNA or RNA and then it translates into amino acids. And that's what we see as all those like lysines and leucines and, and things like that. Um, but to answer your question, introns and extrons are a feature of RNA. And extrons get out and introns stay in. And introns are the ones that get translated to amino acids, which eventually lead to protein. Yes. Um, okay. So I will see you guys next week. Um, Jill is going to do a demonstration on um, how to streak out bacteria. Oh, wait. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, Apple Brain says, yeah, that, that is correct. DNA codes introns, extrons into RNA and then determine protein expression. Yes, yes. Every step of the way um, are what uh, leads to protein expression. And any everywhere from DNA all the way to RNA to protein expression. Yeah. Um, along the way, there are not that many mutations that happen. Uh, there are lots of mutations that happen um, at the DNA level, um, at the programming level. And once the protein gets um, gets made, there's not very many uh, room for error in between, like the transcription translation. So, yeah. H.B. Wilder, why does the RNA drop the thiamine, and what does U do that is different in RNA? So essentially, um, I believe the thiamine gets uh, cleaved in one of the conformations, which turns into a uracil. So if you look side by side, thiamine and uracil, you can see uh, what um, portion gets cleaved off. And then I think an OH, yeah, I think an OH goes in place of that. So by, by like laws of, you know, nomenclature, the thiamine is not called a, a uracil. So we had to call, it's a thiamine is not a thiamine. So we had to call it something else. So we called it a uracil. All right. Without ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jill. Um, I'll see you guys next week. Read those papers, uh, do the experiments, and um, yeah, chat with me online to see if you uh, have any questions or comments or concerns. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to t explain to you about proteins. Okay, cool.
All right, Jill, it's all you. Hi, everyone. Hope you all had a good week since last week. Um, today, we're going to go over your stabs and streaking plates. And shout out to Dixon's Carry NC for uh, for educating us all on computer science terms. Love learning things. So first things first, we are gonna prepare by getting all clean and make sure we don't contaminate our samples. So hair up, gloves on. Fun fact while I'm getting ready, uh, that paper that you guys either have or will read this week is by Roxanne and Watson and Crick, who did very good job with their um, with their models, but Rosalind Franklin did give them major inspiration for how it should look. And when I say major inspiration, two different people, not Watson and Crick themselves, but two different people showed them her work without her permission. So, man, science be crazy. So that's why we always say that Watson, Crick, and Franklin found the structure of DNA. Hi, Mr. Metric. Hello, H.B. Wilder. Hello, Victoria. And so now I have my ethanol or isopropyl. Make my hands all clean. So we have our stab that we sent you with the E. coli, ooh, trying to get it in focus. E. coli, man, that doesn't work so well. Anyways, it's E. coli PJE202. And you have your inoculation loops. So the one thing to remember is uh, since we're using plastic inoculation loops, you pretty much have to use them once or if you want to sanitize them. I don't suggest it um, for like the same experiment. People have in the past with like alcohol or bleach. Um, or you could just get a metal one and run it through a Bunsen burner if you want to reduce on your plastic use. So here we have um, our plate which is LB Amp. So this is what we're going to grow our PJE202 on. So it's once it was poured, it was um, closed and then put in the fridge so nothing else uh, grows on it. And yes, Apple Brain, you can uh, totally email me with questions or find me on Facebook. I'm under Jill E. I'm wearing a blue jacket. Um, or yeah, I think through the, um, the Google Classroom, you can email me too. Uh, and it's Jill or, or my work email is Jill at the Odin.com. The dash Odin, like, like Esther's. So we have, take our lid off. Open it up. Then what we do is we take our loop and in the stab you can kind of see where we stabbed it and got more bacteria so we're going to pick some of that up. Nice and gooey one. Then you take your plate and you kind of streak on the top as such. I go about a quarter of the way in, throw away that inoculation loop. Take another, trying not to get it on the dirty table. Because I'm not at the lab bench, I'm at the, the um, what's it called, the computer bench. And so then I try to find a streak that I was in there. Run my inoculation loop through that. A little bit further. And then throw away that one. And you do this about three or four times where you just keep taking the end of your streak and keep streaking it out and then throw that away. 
Then you close it up. And to grow your bacteria, room temperature is fine. Um, it'll grow at 30 degrees C, so I don't know if you want to hold it in your lap or something. That should be fine too, but it's unnecessary. Just go ahead and leave it at room temperature. It'll grow. When it's grown enough and you want it to stop growing and kind of just hold it so that you can use it at another time, you can put it in the fridge. And can I put a second camera on the desk? Top. Um, I showed you pretty much everything. The desktop doesn't look anything different. I'm just holding stuff. Um, so, uh, because that was a little bit hard to see, because the bacteria is pretty clear at this point, uh, I'll show you with a marker too. So if we have our initial dip in to the, um, to the stab, and then we do our first streak like that, And then throw away the uh, excuse me the inoculation loop. Get a new inoculation loop. Take that corner right there, streak it out. Throw away the inoculation loop. Get a new inoculation loop. Take the corner and streak it out. And then the reason you do this, the reason you streak from the streaks, is that. If you get any contamination, you can still get a little bit of your pure sample. So what you're looking for when you're grabbing, not so much in the stabs, but when you're grabbing from a plate to get a culture, what you want is an individual colony. You want a really small little dot, and then you take that dot. That dot's more likely to be pure, and then you inoculate from that. Um... For the growing the bioluminescent bacteria, a lot of it, it it's it's pretty pretty straightforward, pretty easy to read. Um, Dixon's Cariensi asks, do you overlap the streaks? No. Just just the well, not only the initial one, only when I started a second and a third streak, but then you do not overlap the streaks. Uh, can we freeze any samples and reuse later? Uh, me, myself, uh, we're not freezing. You can't freeze the bacteria. Um, you can put it in the fridge, and that'll keep it for a nice while, so you can reuse it later. But the freezer will kill off all your bacteria, and that wouldn't be good. Uh, Mr. Metric, ah, these are the neat glowing pumpkin bacteria that make the cool pumpkins. It is, yeah. It's that one, which is cool, and I definitely want to do this year. Okay, um, the one thing I want to tell you guys is per, the uh, growing bioluminescent bacteria is pretty straightforward. However, the one thing I want to say is people get a little excited on, um, on like the timing of their bacteria. Biology likes to do things at its own time. And so even though the directions say six to 10 hours, it could be two days. Uh, if you have a nice colder house or if you just happen to get a streak that only started with less bacteria, so it needed more time to propagate, so it grows um, larger, so you can actually see the, um, so you can see the glow. Then it's fine. Try uh, try to be patient, and then if it doesn't work after a couple days, go ahead and email us. Um, but it's not, yeah, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, it's very very cool. Bioluminescence is fun. I have a whole bunch of glowing bioluminescence at home, so it's a good time. Yeah, uh, Mr. Metric, I thought E. coli could be frozen. Does the long-term evolution experiment use special freezers? I'm not sure which long-term evolution experiment you're talking about. Esther, do you know? Mm -hmm. Sorry, we don't know. Uh, go ahead and, and email us about that, and we'll, uh, we'll check it out. Yeah, sorry, I'm just not familiar with that one. Uh, Dixon's Cariancy, cool pumpkins, yeah. If you, um, you could probably just Google. So, I'm done with my experiment. I can take off my glove so I don't contaminate the laptop. Uh, if you Google bioluminescent pumpkins, what? 
Let's see. Under, I think it's fishbio.com. Oh. Nah, they didn't show cool. Also, I'll try to find a link and put it on um, on the thing tonight. I will. I'll see if I can get a link and put it on the um, on the rest of the. Uh, sorry, I'll try to see if I can put it on Google Classroom. I was also I was trying to read and talk to you guys at the same time. That was not efficient. Um, Oh, cool. Mr. Metric included the the wiki. How do you dispose of the rest of the cultures? You dispose of the rest of the cultures. Uh, if you really want to kill what's ever in there, you can do alcohol or bleach. And then you just screw on the lid and toss it in the garbage. It's fine. These are not quite so. The dog breeder's guy's name is David Ishii. Okay, let's see. Um, can E. coli be damaged by a couple hours of sunlight through a window? Should I move my table? Um, I don't know. I, the reason I would be scared of, um, of sunlight is for contamination reasons instead. Mold-like sunlight. I work with, um, mushrooms a lot and you want to leave it in the dark because sunlight means mold. Um... Yeah, just go ahead and uh, put, you can just put it under a box. That should be fine. Yeah. So if you're saying the praises of DVD sheet, as we need to, go ahead and uh, look him up if you guys have some free time. He's really cool. Does interesting work with dogs. And uh, yeah, made the video about glowing pumpkins. And Mr. Metric's just given us all the information today. Man, making my job easier. Thank you, Mr. Metric. Okay, uh, before we sign off, are there any more questions? Esther pointed out that E. coli can mutate under UV, so it can alter the DNA slightly. Yeah, just, just put it in the shade. It's fine. Cool. Okay, um, oh, apologies, can you hear like on my proteins? Oh, someone has a proteins question. Cool. Okay. I can answer that question. So Kent um, asks, um, if the structure of the protein is known, can the nucleotide sequence that produce a determination of some sort of reverse translation? Yes. Um, in practice, you can find a novel protein um, and you can reverse engineer it um, all the way back to DNA. So, um, so like, for example, if you want to do that, then you figure out the amino acid sequence of the proteins and then you can reverse engineer it to RNA and then reverse engineer it to DNA. Um, that's commonly a, a common practice done in industry that um, that's how you find like novel proteins um, and things like and function and functionality of proteins. Yeah. Okay. Um, ah, Alexis has a great question. How do you reculture bacteria from one petri dish? Oh, so in that case, um, you can either, I don't like this, that's <laughs> weird, there we go. Either you, um, if you want to do it into a liquid culture, you take that, you know, the tiny speck of colony that we were talking about and put it into your liquid media and swirl it around. And if you want to go from petri dish to petri dish, it's the same process. You take a little bit of culture, and then you streak, and then you streak again. You just have infinite streak of these glowing bacteria plates, which I kind of want to do. Just have it all glowing. It'd be really fun. Cool. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for signing in. And... Yeah, go ahead and contact us if you have any questions. And yeah, we will see you next week.
Have a nice one. Bye. So the OBS, you can just end stream.